Greetings and welcome. Hey, y'all. Hey, it is me, Dr. Sherry Estalone. I wanted to come on and spend a little time with you guys going over the template for your second draft of your final paper. All right, so let's get started with looking at the template for the second draft. All right. For your second draft, by this point, you should definitely have your paper um, fully formatted. Um, and I want to reiterate at this point that this template was based upon um, the crisis assessment and intervention model. However, this, this model is just that model. In other words, this template was just about that model. The only thing this template is designed to do is to show you proper headings to show you how things go in certain places and to give you a guide. If you are doing a different model, like if you're doing psychological first aid, wardens, task, um, Robert, seven stage, any of those other models, if you're doing any of those others, then your headings are going to be a little bit different. You're not going to mention assessment or intervention tasks. Assessment and intervention tasks are specific to this model. So this is just a guide for you to you know, set up your paper. Um, by now, at this point in your educational journey, you should know how to use proper headings. Um, but if you're unsure, check your APA manual, or you can just simply Google it, and it'll help you along the way, OK? So for starters, again, this up here is the title of your paper, which should be the exact same title as your intro at this point. I'm still unclear why we're making those mistakes. This is your intro section. This should not say introduction. This title right here should mimic this title right here, okay? So you have your title. By now, everybody should have their intro section um, completely done. Oops. Um, we have, you have your first paragraph that just talks about a crisis in general. The second paragraph that talks about crisis models in general. Why were crisis models created? What was the purpose? Um, how are they used? So you're gonna explain this crisis model um, in detail, um, just the crisis models, I'm sorry, in general detail. And then the third um, paragraph is about the theme of your crisis. If your crisis is about um, a client who has been um, sexually assaulted, then your theme is that your sexual assault. So, you know, what is sexual assault? Um, you know, what are the st statistics around sexual assault? Things like that. How often does it affect men versus women? Anything, just a broad overview of the theme of your crisis. Nowhere in your intro section should you talk at all about your client. This is not specific to your client. This is a broad overview of your paper. And then you're going to jump into your crisis. You do not have to say, my client Celeste, or um, a young woman came to see me. Just simply jump right in. Celeste is a 23-year-old 20, African-American female, da 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 da, -da. Okay? Um, and just jump in and introduce your client, explain what is the crisis? What is this client coming to you for? What has she experienced? In this example, she's facing an unexpected pregnancy due to a gang rape um, at college. And so give us what happened and then that's it. That is done. For now, you are done talking about your client and then you are going to jump straight into the literature review, which at this point, all the literature reviews should be done. Quite a few of you will have to go back in and edit and correct your literature review because a literature review is just that. What does the literature say about this model? In other words, as you are doing a deep dive into the literature about your chosen model, one source is not adequate. That is not an adequate literature review. A literature review, you're going to have at least five to seven different sources that you are researching that's going to give you different lenses to look at your model. Okay? So 
again, we have our fictitious crisis. The next section, again, which should have been turned in by now, um, is the title of your crisis model. If it's psychological first aid, that goes here. If it is warden's task model of grieving, that goes here. If it is Gilliland's six-step model, that goes here. Whatever your crisis model is, identify it here. You then want to give a broad overview of your specific model, your model. Again, we're not talking about your client. We're talking strictly about your model. Why was your model created? Um, where did it come from? Um, you know, who created it? What was the goal? Did they, you know, glean information from other models that are similar? So this is just, again, it's almost like an intro section into your specific model. And then from there, you want to break your model down, whatever your model is. For instance, if your model is psychological first aid, the psychological first aid has eight different, um, what some people call them tasks, some people call them steps. And so you would start with doing a level two heading that just explains the breakdown of your model. You would explain if you had PFA, you would explain the, uh, the PFA tasks or you know, the PFA steps or the PFA stages. And you might explain that there's eight different stages and why are these stages created? Um, are they congruent? Are they cyclical? Will people, you know, start on one, jump to seven, come back to three? So you want to explain an overview of your specific steps right here, okay? And then from there, you literally jump into your steps. For assessment and intervention, you have assessment task one, then assessment task two, then assessment task three, then assessment task four. For PFA, you have Psychological first aid step one or stage one, psychological first aid stage two, psychological first aid stage three, all the way through to eight. And yes, you will have to do a literature review on each step. What is the step? What does it mean? What does it entail? How will it look? You want to glean all the literature you can about each specific step. Again, by this point, all that should be done. Um, if you've received my edits and my corrections, many of you may have to go back in and look at quite a few other sources and then come back in and add some more meat to these paragraphs. Pause, paragraphs. Ladies and gentlemen, two sentences is not a full paragraph. It is not acceptable, nor is it a complete literature review. So just be mindful that you're using full sentences, you're using full paragraphs, okay? But again, most of that work should have been done. The meat and the hard work should have been done. You may have to go back in and edit and tweak it. But here we are for phase, for your second draft, for draft number two. Now you should be working on your counselor skills and client roles. This is the place where you can use first person. Um, in this section, you are literally walking your client through each and every step of your model, whatever your specific model is. Remember, if up here we are talking about assessment task one or psychological first aid step one, and we're explaining what it is, then under counselor skills and client roles, we are specifically talking about how you walk to your client through step one, assessment one, stage one, whatever. And so it should literally look something like this. Um, if this was my client, it would say something like starting here. Celeste came into my office and I did a complete biopsychosocial as outlined in assessment task one. Assessment task one says to create a, uh, you know, a biopsychosocial you want to you want to cite that, but you want to say she came into my office. We did a complete biopsychosocial. Um, as this was our first first session, we spent some time doing small talk in order to build a rapport, because the literature has shown us that building a rapport, um, you know, will help make your client feel more comfortable. So again, you can cite something like that. You can go on to say once we establish a level of comfort. 
I gently probed Celeste to help me understand what brought her in today. She stated she was not comfortable talking about it yet and she began to cry hysterically. I allowed her room to cry and I verbally encour encouraged her by letting her know she was safe. Since I was aware that Celeste had been raped, I made sure not to physically touch her as research shows this can be counterproductive and then you have your citation. Once she regained her composure, I went back to small talk and we just established a level of comfort. I then booked her next session for tomorrow at the same time. She stated she was looking forward to coming back in. That is what you will need for counselor skills and client roles. A lot of it is first person because I want you to literally physically tell me what you did. Not if this was real, this is what I would do. I want you to, I want it to be real. This is what I did for my client. Um, and there will be some citations because you are going to do something that the literature says is valid. Whether you, the literature may say, you know, asking a lot of open questions in order to get the counselor to dialogue. And so you can say, you know, I engaged her in conversation by asking a lot of open questions. And then you can cite it because the literature says that, you know, asking open questions is beneficial. So that's how you would handle that. So you have your client counselor skills and client roles. Then you're going to jump right back into, you know, assessment task two or psychological first aid um, step two or whatever your model is. Um, whatever it is, wardens, um, four tasks of grieving, what is the second task of grieving, whatever it is, you're going to give an in-depth literature review in this section about your second task, nothing about your client, strictly about step two. And just like I mentioned here, just like you did for assessment task one, do for PFA step one, Gilliland step one, wardens, you know, whatever you do, you're going to keep that format. You're going to rinse and repeat. And then again, you're going to come right back to counselor skills and client roles. And I'm not sure if you can recognize, but here we have a level one heading. Here we have a level two heading. Here we have a level three heading. And then counselor skills and client roles is our level four heading. Now, this may not be the case for you. Counselor skills and client roles may not be a level four. It may be a level three based upon however your model is set up. So make sure your model is just following the heading template for your model. Again, that is why I have you guys do it in drafts because if you make an error, we can correct it and we can have it ready before you submit your final paper, okay? So for this specific example, counselor skills and client roles would be a level four heading. A level four heading is bold. It is indented. And your sentence will start on the same line. That's really important to note take your level four. Whereas your level three is flush left. It's bold and it's italicized. But your sentence starts on the very next line. And again, if you forget any of this information, you can simply find it in your APA manual, or you can just Google the seventh edition APA manual and you will find this information, okay? All right, so here we go. Back to assessment task two or PFA step two or whatever step two, you're gonna go back to your counselor skills and client roles. And again, you jump straight in. Celeste came into my office at the appointed time the next day. We greeted each other and I offered her a bottle of water. She accepted and I gave her time to get settled in and get comfortable. I opened the session by asking her about her dog, which she told me about yesterday. This tool is often used for victims of crimes in order to let their guard down. And then there's a citation. She perked up as she talked about something safe and familiar. We talked about her dogs and animals in general for about 10 minutes. I then transitioned into psychoeducation around rape and how this is an underreported crime. I gave her a handout about rape statistics and reclaiming personal power. And I want you to see what this says. This says, see Appendix A. 
if you don't remember anything else in this video, remember this. This is this stage you're going to have to submit your appendix. This is how you cite an appendix within the body of your paper. You capitalize the S, you capitalize the A for appendix, and if there's more than one, then you would label them A, B, C, D, and E, all right? Um, if you only have one, you would just simply say C appendix. Um, but hopefully you guys have such good information that you want to include more than one, but you, you're only required to do one. So this is exactly how you cite it, capital S, capital A, and then the identifier if there's more than one. So I gave her a handout about rape statistics and reclaiming her personal power, C appendix A. I wanted her to feel powerful for reporting this crime and applaud her for getting the mental health help she needed. Before I continue, I wanna go back to uh, your appendix. Your appendices should be after your references. After your reference pages, then you would start with your appendices and your appendix. Um, we're gonna go look at those in a minute. So let's get back to this. Um, she asked questions about the handout and then she slowly began to tell me what happened to her. I listened without interruption. I chose to audio record her with her previous written consent because I did not want to distract her by taking notes or jotting down questions. Franklin and Jones, 2021, there's my citation, has determined that many clients feel a heightened level of stress when they recognize that a therapist is writing down particular parts of their statement, all right? And that's, that's it. That's what you have done for counselor skills and client roles for step two. And so again, you will simply repeat this cycle until you have completed the factual research or literature review on each and every step or phase of your specific chosen crisis model, okay? That should be fairly simple. Um, but if you're unsure if you need assistance, do not hesitate to reach out. Someone's probably going to ask me, do I have to include a citation in that section? And my answer is yes. You need at least one or two be citations because you want to show that the things that you are doing for this client, you're doing it based upon the literature review, based upon the things that you have learned. Okay. All right. So that's it for the literature, literature review and then the counselor skills and client roles. Then you're going to jump straight into your resources. Um, again, I've you know, written some really powerful information here. Providing resources is an important part of helping an individual in a crisis situation. This is a factual sentence. So there's my citation. Um, resources can be defined. So you want to explain what resources are give, a, again, almost like an introduction to what are resources? Why would a client need resources after a crisis? So this is like a broad intro into what resources are with citations. Again, in this paragraph, this intro of resources, you do not need to mention your client at all. You're just simply explaining what are resources and how are they valuable to, um, you know, to clients in general. All right, so then we're gonna look, we're gonna dive deeper and we're gonna talk about short, medium and long-term resources. And this is where your client comes back in the picture, right? So here again, you can use first person and you're gonna definitely use some citations and you're gonna talk about your client. So you're gonna start with, what is a short-term resource you would use for your client? So in this case, um, an immediate short-term resource to offer Celeste would be the reinforcement in her personal support system. Family support systems have proven to be a healthy way for victims to re-engage in society. There's my citation. Um, I talked more about how Celeste says she's close with her family and even her church. Um, and just expressing, you know, even if you bring up her church, how, what does the literature say about how the faith-based community, um, you know, supports people in crisis, okay? And then for a medium term resource, um, in this paragraph, of course, you can talk about your client and you definitely want to cite. Um, I talked about how Celeste, um, you know, may be having, you know, some issues 
regarding trauma and PTSD, and it may also be a financial strain on her. And so I even cited how crisis can be a financial strain on individuals and victims. There's my resource. And I made sure that I gave her a handout of resources that will mitigate her financial strain. And what do I have here? C, Appendix B, right? So I'm showing that I already have an Appendix A. Now I have an Appendix B. Um, and that's why it's capitalized. You have the capital S, capital A, and capital B. Um, we talked, to, this section talks about what I'm gonna do for her in the medium term. And I also went out to say, went on to say that Celeste was given a handout that included local rape crisis centers. And what do we have here? C, Appendix C. So it may just simply be a list. You can create the list. Your appendix can be anything you want it to be. It can honestly be a biopsychosocial that you found online. Um, make sure you cite where you got it from. Or it could be one that you personally created. You just want to make sure that you recognize that this appendix is a visual representation of something you gave to your client or talked about with your client or assisted your client with, okay? Then you're gonna jump straight into your long-term resources. And you know what is something that she's gonna need in the long-term? And again, short, medium, and long-term is subjective. I will look at short-term as something that can happen within the next two weeks. I will look at medium-term as something that can happen within the next 30 to 45 days. And I will look at long-term as something that can happen you know, 60 days and beyond. Um, but again, it's subjective. So it's just as long as you justify, you know, what you are doing and what you deem to be short, medium, and long-term, okay? Again, you can bring in your client. You can use first person. Um, however, you need to also bring in some facts and make sure it is well-cited. <clears throat> then we have your personal impact. This section is all about you. This is 100% about you. If this had been a real client, and for some of you, this is a real situation, but if this had been a real client with this specific crisis, how do you personally believe you would have handled the situation? Did this crisis bring up any triggering feelings for you? Um, did it, you know, did you have to take a break from the assignment to reflect on your own personal experiences? Do you wish someone would have walked you through a crisis model like this when you dealt with your own issues? So this personal impact is one to two paragraphs of like your own reflective feelings about this specific fictitious crisis, all right? And then we have your summary conclusion. Your summary, um, oops, my bad, I have a typo, uh-oh. Your summary and conclusion is your opportunity to tie uh, your entire paper together. This section should be factual. Again, this section has nothing to do with your client. This is not about Celeste anymore. This is all about the facts surrounding your paper, the facts surrounding your crisis models. How are crisis models good, um, you know, in this specific crisis? How did PFA, you know, work with, you know, a rape situation? How did Warden's task model work with a divorce, whatever it is, if this is your whole summary and conclusion, this should be about two solid paragraphs and it must be cited. Yes, you will reiterate some facts about your crisis model with citations. Do not copy and paste sentences. We're not copy and pasting any sentences. You are just simply, you might have to re-paraphrase and re-summarize um, some of the facts about your model. Now, what you don't want to do in this section is try to take up space. So you don't want to, you know, uh, if yours is PFA, you don't want to relist the eight steps of PFA. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for how did PFA, um, from its formation to its conclusion, how did it benefit your client? Okay. All right. So for draft two, the one that is due next, you need to make sure that you have all edits and corrections from draft one. All of them need to be completed. Um, some people have said they're not able to see my uh, notes on their paper. And if that is the case, make sure you inbox me so I can send you another copy because I can see all of my notes. So I want to make sure you can see them. Um, for draft two, you should have a minimum. Look, me in these typos. Uh-oh. You should have a minimum of 11 accurately cited references. 
Yes, you may include more. Draft two is pretty much your entire paper completed. Um, draft two, you will need an accurately cited appendix. Um, if you're unsure how to do this, I've just showed you in the template, but also refer to your APA manual, okay? So then you have your references page. I want you to go back through each and every one of your references and make sure that they are cited within the body of your paper, okay? Make sure your references on this page are formatted correctly according to APA style. Um, make sure that you just didn't copy and paste from the library because there may be some errors that you're gonna be held accountable for. So make sure you look over it with a fine tooth comb. And then after your references, you have your appendix. Here's appendix A. And you know th this one, this appendix A actually covered two pages, but this is where appendix A was received from. So you wanna put this resource here just to show where it was received from because Turnitin is gonna look at it as possible plagiarism. So you wanna show where you got it from. Then you have your appendix B, whatever your appendix B is. And then where did you get it from? And then appendix C. Which is, you know, a race rape crisis line. Okay. All right. That may sound like a lot, but I promise you it's not. You guys have already done the hard work. You've already done the hard work. You completed the bulk of your literature review. Yes, for many of you, your literature review still needs a lot of work. You still need to go back in, add some more resources, and do some more in depth digging. But for the most part, you all did a really good job and the hard part is over. Right now, you are actively interacting with your client. You are the therapist. You are actively walking your client through each step of your chosen crisis model, okay? And then you're adding in your resources, short, medium, and long-term, your personal impact, your summary conclusion, and your references, okay? I hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> I believe you all are going to do an amazing job. I am genuinely proud of you. And again, for those whose papers I have not um, gotten completed yet, please be patient with me. I am getting those to you as soon as possible. But again, you got this and I'm here to support. If you want to chat with me about your paper, if you have any questions, if you are unclear about any of my comments, please inbox me in Canvas and let's set up some time via Zoom to meet and talk. All right. I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. I cannot wait to read your second drafts because you, are, you all are doing stellar work. I will talk with you soon. Have a great day. Bye.